don't know what to say. This is always so hard to come up with like the words to describe your students. Um, they've been working with me for eight years, and so I've gotten to know her really well and watched her basically grow up from a little <laughs> like fresh out of high school and to now um, renowned scientist who gives some scientific talks around the country. And so we're just really proud of her. Um, she's uh, just grown a lot, and I'm really excited for her to share with you what she's been doing. I want to thank also her co-advisor, Joe Reinhardt, and our, the rest of her committee for helping. Um, it's definitely been a team effort, and we're just really proud of her. So. I'm going to stop now before I start crying. <laughs> I just, um, I'm thrilled for Meg today. So take it away. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about what I've been doing for the last five years. And um, I'm really proud to share with you the work that I've done looking at how spring conditions affect leaf cutting bees. So I like to start off this talk with this comic because it's actually a funny depiction of the framework of my dissertation. And that framework is climate change is affecting spring conditions. It's causing temperature variability, and you can see that on this newspaper here. Mother Nature is also experiencing spring cold snaps. So you can see these flowers developing and green leaves and then accompanied by those icicles, okay? So with that in mind, two things are a problem when Mother Nature is giving mixed signals. One is, how do animals tell time? So what cues are they using to time their life history? And this is commonly referred to as phenology. So the timing of uh, life history events like reproduction or migration in birds or even budding in plants. Another problem that this causes is spring cold snaps can induce chill injury in plants and animals. And so chill injury are um, injuries sustained from being cold when you are not at your most cold hardy stage. So you can see this big pile of snow on these apple blossoms. And these are actually um, the buds of an apple tree that went through a spring cold snap. The ones on the right are um, ones that are injured, and then the ones on the left are uninjured. Uh, one of the big problems of uh, cold snaps is it causes animals that aren't in their overwintering stages injury or death. And in this case, this amphibian died because it actually was caught in a spring cold snap. So that frog isn't like the wood frog that can freeze and still live. This one actually got caught in a cold snap and it froze to the ground. So you can see that there are widespread implications of spring cold snaps for both plants and animals. So first let's tackle this um, idea of how animals tell time. Because in the spring, conditions are changing, environmental cues are changing, and animals and plants are relying on Mother Nature to be giving honest cues about what's going on about the environment. So some of the cues that regulate uh, biological rhythms and circadian rhythms are photoperiod, uh, those are changes in day length, or thermoperiod, changes in temperature. Those are two very common, what's called zeitgaters. And so that is a term derived from the chronobiology literature, which is the study of time. And that is a German word, and when you break it down, it essentially means time giver. So anything that's a zeitgeber interacts with your circadian clocks, your internal clocks, which mediates a pattern of either physiological or behavioral outputs. So um, Carl Linnaeus was actually thinking about this a long time ago, and he wanted to demonstrate uh, circadian rhythms by planting a garden that is in the shape of a clock. And what's interesting about this garden is that these flowers open and close at different times of the day. So by planting different species around in a clock, you can see that they, he demonstrated these daily uh, patterns and activity, which is blue, like circadian rhythms. So um, when we think about what cues are important, what cues are zeitgebers, the dominant and most universal zeitgeber is photoperiod. 
because it plays a huge role from cyanobacteria all the way up to humans. It's a major zygaber that mediates daily uh, rhythms and behavior and physiology. Some examples in plants and animals, we have the timing of blooming for many trees and flower species. Also, um, the timing of activity. Um, also, uh, breeding and reproduction in birds. Birds really rely on photoperiod cues to know what time it is. And also, pollinators, their um, foraging activity and the bloom of flowers are two things that are known to be um, dominated by uh, photoperiod. One is because a lot of bees can't see um, at night, so photoperiod is a very important cue for them to forage. So we know a lot um, about the role of photoperiod for animals because it has such a pervasive role. But one of the things that is less studied is how temperature changes um, act as zygabers for organisms, okay? And so I, when I was looking up um, different animals that rely on temperature instead of photoperiod because they're in some kind of light restricted habitat, it was really hard to find pictures that weren't really ugly because they're all like dark pictures. They're all animals that live in really dark places. So a couple examples of this, these are all animals that um, are relying on spring te temperatures instead of photoperiod for timing um, behavior. And so this is a bog turtle here. This is his little head, and you can see the eye and mouth. They actually hibernate under the sediment. And um, so they're under the sediment and underwater, so you can imagine that they're light stri restricted. And so the warming temperatures of spring uh, regulate the emergence from under the sediment. Similarly, in these eastern box turtles, they hibernate in these burrows. And so in the spring, um, they know what time it is and know when to come out because those temperatures are increasing. These oysters do the same um, for an oyster. Uh, spring temperatures regulate valve opening. And if your valves are open for an oyster, that means you're waking up in the spring. It's called spring awakening in oysters. And also we have some burrowing mammals that are rodents that also um, rely on temperature cues. So I want to talk about a bee that also nests in light restricted habitats and I want to look at this idea of if mother nature is giving mixed cues or if temperature fluctuations are being affected by um, climate change, how would this affect how bees tell time? And for the majority of bee species, they're solitary. And solitary bees share very similar life history in that they are cavity nesters. So the model that we're looking at is the alfalfa leaf cutting bee. What they do is the females will go cut these leaves. This is actually a picture from a nesting box. Um, I had a nesting box in my backyard a few years ago, and so it was cool to be able to see where they're doing their work. This is a little sapling tree here. You can see that they cut these little pieces of leaves. A female will find some kind of cavity. Um, in this case, it was between some bricks. Uh, they will build a nest inside the, that cavity. Um, they also build in artificial and natural cavities, like um, the, stop, the stem of a rose or in the groove of a tree. So they, there's actually quite a bit of variation of where they build their nests. And when they're building their nests, they look a lot like this. Um, they build them in a linear series, and this is three different brood cells and nest cells that you see here. What the female will do is she'll load those nest cells up with pollen and nectar, she'll lay an egg, and then that um, larvae consumes that entire provision until they're in this big, fat, pre-pupil stage. And it's actually really funny, when we x-ray them at this stage, they're like so fat. They like, it almost looks like they barely fit in there. <laughs> and so once they're this big, fat, pre-pupil stage, that's when they'll hunker down and go through winter. Because they have all those reserves, and until spring um, temperatures start to increase, they're going to hold off until that happens and then resume metamorphosis. And so these are some pupil stages of a bee developing there. And so I'm very interested in this system because um, if we take a look at their life cycle, uh, I'm interested in this side, okay? Because you see that, as I mentioned before, they overwinter in this big fat pre-pupil stage. And then when spring temperatures start to warm, you, um, they, uh, pupil metamorphosis is activated. 
And so this is the time in their life cycle when they're going to be experiencing those bouts of cold outside the overwintering stage. So this is a cool system for a number of reasons. Not just on the basic science side of things, but they also, um, the alfalfa leafcutter bee is the most intensively managed pollinator in agriculture. They're, they serve a super important role pollinating alfalfa. And um, what's really cool is that the timing of their, or the timing of, um, of emergence is regulated by farmers because if something happens, like they get bad weather, well, they need to, and, and that pushes back the timing of their alfalfa bloom. They need to slow down the bees' development to better match when bees emerge and then the peak bloom of their crops occur. So they actually use low temperature storage in agriculture to um, regulate this process. And we don't know what the implications are, consequences are, of those low temperature storage treatments. So along with spring cold snaps, we have um, the relevance of low temperature in agriculture. Also, um, if we know what cues these bees are using to, to synchronize emergence, um, we could better sy help synchronize emergence for peak crop bloom if we know what cues they're picking up on. So I have this talk split into two overarching questions. We're going to tackle the first question, and then we're going to move on to the second one later in the talk. The first question is, how do spring conditions regulate the timing of adult emergence? What cues are relevant zeitgebers for this bee species that nests in a linear series inside of a cavity? So this is a little cartoon here of a bee um, with its nest emerging from the cavity. So what cues are regulating emergence? It's a really interesting system because if your sibling does not emerge in front of you, then you have to chew through them. So they have to emerge um, in series. And so very little is known about what cues regulate emergence in many solitary bee species. The other half of this talk, we're going to talk about this cold snap situation and how low temperature exposure during active metamorphosis affects adult performance. So whether you're experiencing a cold snap while you're developing out in the wild, or whether a farmer is putting you in the fridge to slow you down, what are the consequences of those conditions on adult bees? So back to this timing question. If we want to talk about how organisms tell time, we rely on the chronobiology field. And so to walk you through this, Remember, we talked about zygebers, and so they can be an environmental cue which synchronizes your circadian clocks. And when I, re when I reference circadian clocks, I'm talking about molecular feedback loops. Um, and so a zygeber interacts with circadian clocks which mediates some kind of behavioral output on a rhythmic basis or a physiological output. In our case, we're interested in uh, the emergence. What, what cues regulate the clocks that mediate the rhythmic um, emergence of bees. So in order to test whether or not something is a zygaber for an animal, if something is a relevant cue and is interacting with those clocks, you perform a classic experiment. And this classic experiment is shown here. So let's imagine that this is an activity plot of some kind of nocturnal animal so these are their zygaber here, their here. Every time, at the same time, at every day, they're doing something on a rhythmic basis at the same time because they have these cues. If you want to know if a zygaber is interacting with circadian clocks, what you do is then remove that cue after exposing them to it. Because if their clocks are still running, they should still be synchronized, but they don't have anything to keep their time, so they should slowly free run. So their shifting of their activity rhythm slowly shifts, and that's called free running, because they have nothing to reset their clocks. So if a zygaber wasn't interacting with your circadian clocks, you would see um, when you remove the zygaber, just uniform and like not synchronized, the rhythm would no longer be synchronized because those activity, uh, those clocks are not activated. So before I wanted to, before I asked the question of what relevant cues, what are relevant cues for this bee, 
I had to see if the universal Zeitgeber thing, if the universal uh, photo period as being the universal Zeitgeber is true in this system. The first thing I needed to do though was if look at and see if they even receive light cues. So they're in this cap, they're in, in inside this cavity, inside of brood cell. How much light cues are they actually receiving? So what I did is I built a little adapter that fits on a handheld spectrophotometer. This measures light and it measures the intensity of light. And I put a little brood cell over the front of the adapter and isolated different wavelengths of LEDs. I actually had to close myself into a dark incubator and um, eliminate all external light. So after spending like a week and like seven hours inside of an incubator each day or whatever, like it was pretty like, it was pretty crazy. But it was a fun experiment and what I ended up seeing was that uh, these are our different wavelengths here. About 20% of ambient light gets into the brood cell. Uh, predominantly green wavelengths, interestingly, about 40% get in. So we know that there's the potential for them to receive light cues. So if we want to get at this question of how do we know what cues are regulating the emergence and timing of emergence in this bee, we had to get a little creative. Because measuring insect emergence is actually notoriously difficult. The reason why, you have to have a bunch of people or some grad student, not me, <laughs> watching around the clock trying to record when an insect emerges for the first time in its life, okay? And so there's, you lose some accuracy there because a grad student can't be there 24 seven. So what we do instead is you can build an apparatus. And so we built an apparatus to semi-automate this process when we leave. And so how this works, I'll just walk you through it quick. We have um, bees inside these Eppendorf tubes. So we have a brood cell in each of them. When the bee emerges, this is actually a top view of our system, so we're looking down at it. Um, if the bee emerges and it will free a little metal BB which will roll down this runway and activate a sensor which will record the date and time of emergence. So we can get accuracy of time of emergence like for, you know, down to the second of when the bee first emerges. So this is the front of the rack that you're looking at. We actually 3D printed all of these things here because the best part about 3D printing is when you're making something and need it exactly the way you want it it enables you to do that. So we have these racks. Um, this is the front of the rack you're looking at. Uh, you'll see some red airsoft pellets and metal BBs, and I'll explain that on the next slide. But the whole reason why this system works is because right here, this is the brain of the system. This Arduino Nano is like a cool little computer that you can program and tell to do exactly what you want it to do. Um, so we told this little computer when a BB crosses the sensor, when the voltage drops below a certain threshold, record the date and time of emergence. Um, so this was programmed and um, on this big PCB board here, we also have a clock to help the whole system keep time and then the data is dumped on this SD card. So it's pretty automated. I could just set this up, close the incubator door and go to Mexico. And I've actually have done that a few times. So <laughs> that's why I can relate to that. So <laughs> silly committee, you taught me how to automate my data collection. <laughs> so let's look at how this works a little more closely. So I have a little cartoon here to show you how this works. We have our Eppendorf tubes um, and a little brood cell inside here. In front of it, we have an airsoft pellet and that metal BD I was talking about. When the bee emerges, it will push that red airsoft pellet into the metal BB, freeing it to pass through the infrared sensor, recording the date and time of emergence. And so our infrared sensor is a um, LED that is an infrared emitter and then an LED detector. So with this system, we're able to look at fine scale changes in emergence rhythms because those racks can hold 50 bees per rack, and we can fit about 1,000 bees into a single experiment. So the data that I'm gonna show you is really beautiful, brace yourself, <laughs> because it's all like a really large sample size, and in order to get and, and examine if these cues are interacting with um, internal clocks, then we need to have a large sample size to see these patterns. 
So my three big questions about how they tell time are, what about thermal period? What, cue do, what role does this cue play or photo period? Since we know that light can get into the brood cell, how important is photo period in mediating emergence? And then the big question, which one is more dominant? And so this idea is talked about in the chronobiology literature, and um, there's a really clever way to test which cue is more dominant, which one are they more likely to listen to. So before I show you um, our data, I have to show you what bee emergence looks like when nobody knows what's going on, okay? So in this graph here, this is a graph from Yoakum et al. A uh, brilliant paper. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I'm on your committee. <laughs> Apparently you haven't signed it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're looking at is um, a group of bees uh, this is a bubble graph, so the size of the bubble is the bigger the bubble, the more bees are emerging that time. The smaller the bubble, the less bees are emerging during that time. This is the time in hours um, of the day, and then this is the number of days of emergence. So these bees emerge over a number of days. And um, what you can see is if they're at constant temperatures in darkness, nobody knows what time it is. They're all emerging at different times of the day. So we call this uniform emergence, or asynchronous emergence, they're not synchronous. So to test what cues are relevant to zeitgebers, first we have to give them one. We know what it looks like when they don't have any way to tell time, so now we have to give them one, and then we need to take it away and see what happens. And I'm just gonna warn you that my data is actually flipped upside down, so you're gonna see, I don't wanna spoil the surprise, but you, you may see this free running rhythm on top and then the synchronization on bottom. So let's check it out. So the first thing I wanted to look at is because they're cavity nesters, what relevance is temperature changes or thermal periods for them in synchronizing emergence. So on the x-axis, again, we have our time and hours, day of emergence. So for the first three days of emergence, we expose them to a thermal period, an increase in temperature and a decrease in temperature later in the day. Look at that, right when they got that cue, they synchronized emergence really tightly to that time of the day when the, thermal, when the temperature is increasing. So above this dotted line, what we did is we took their zygaber away. We put them at constant temperatures and darkness, and they're also in darkness here. And look what we saw. We saw that they were synchronous. Um, they're still synchronous, but their rhythms start to free run. You can see that the, these little dash bars up here are the mean time of emergence, and they're slowly shifting. In order to analyze this data, we had to use um, some magic. It's called circular statistics, because this is circular data. So if I have a data point that's over at 23 hours, it's not super far away from 1 a.m., right? So we, need, we needed to account for the circular data. Um, so uh, we got the help from Kurt, the statistician here, and he helped us perform circular statistics, which tells us that the mean time of emergence shifts from when before the zygaber was on and then afterwards. So we have clearly free running rhythms. Another cool thing that we can do with circular statistics is ask the question if something is our data set uniform or is it directional? And in our case, if it's directional, emergence is synchronous. And so these values down here tell us that emergence is indeed synchronous. Hey Meg? Yeah. Can I interrupt? Can you just explain this again? What I, I'm, Sure. What was it before day, day one and then? So for the first three days of emergence, we gave them this thermal period. So I just have the thermal period displayed here to show uh, what, what it would look like in a day. But each day, uh, for the first three days, they got this thermal period. And prior to that? What's that? What was prior to Oh, that? prior to that, like while they were developing, or no? Prior to your day one. Prior to my day one, they were in this thermal period. They were in that They time. were, mm hmm yep. But good question, we're actually gonna address that idea later in the talk. Okay, so what about photo period? We know that they can receive light cues, or they have, it's possible they can receive light cues, so what did they do? We performed the same kind of experiment. We gave them a photo period. You can see, once we gave them that photo period, they synchronized to around when the lights turn on. But when we turned them off, the mean time of emergence was, statistically, was not statistically different. 
So they were still synchronous, but the mean time of emergence did not change. Um, so it's clear that uh, photo period probably is interacting with their circadian clocks because they are still synchronous. But the hypothesis um, in chronobiology is if you don't see that free running period with the, the, the phases just advancing or being delayed, then they might not be as sensitive to this Zeitgeber. But we're not done yet. If they respond to both cues, which one is more dominant, right? So in order to do this, as I mentioned before, there's a clever experiment that you can perform. On the x-axis, we have the time of day. On the y-axis, we have temperature. What you do is you decouple the cues. So you have the lights turn on when the temperatures are decreasing and the lights turn off when the temperatures are increasing. And so you have a conflicting cue here. So are they going to synchronize to when the lights first turn on? Or are they going to synchronize to when the temperatures first increase at the later part of the day? Drum roll, please. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so we have our photo period here, our thermal period. Overwhelmingly, they synchronize to when the temperature increased in the later part of the day. And that is backed up by our circular statistics that this data was directional. So that was really cool to us because this further supports the hypothesis that animals in light-restricted environments may rely on other cues. So it seems like um, temperature could be a really important cue for this bee. Since we know it's a really important cue, I, the next question was, well, wait a minute, temperature is really variable. So how sensitive are they to temperature? So we wanted to know how sensitive they are so we, uh, we adjusted different ramp speeds of temperature and tried to see if even slow ramp speeds, speeds could they synchronize to that. Also, this, this, um, this bee has a really cool life history in that it has a stage where bees are emergence ready. And what this means is that they're adults, but they just hang out in their brood cell. And nobody knows why. It could be a timing thing. So what I want to know, are emergence ready bees sensitive to thermal periods? So if we don't give them a thermal period throughout development, or even when the first group of bees start emerging, can we just turn a thermal period on and the remaining emergence ready bees, can they sense that? Also, are they sensitive to photo period? Because this would actually be the stage I would predict they would most likely be receiving the most light cues. Because when your sibling emerges in front of you, that is allowing light to enter the nest. So first let's look at um, our temperature sensitivity, all right? So what we did is we looked at two different types of ramp speeds, a fast ramp speed and then a slow ramp speed. And so what we saw is with the fast ramp speed, we get that classic synchronization to right when the temperatures increase. But interestingly, with our slow ramp speed, we found that the data was still directional and it was around the time when the temperature started to first increase right here. And so this ramp speed was actually a third of a degree per hour. So that's really sensitive. And this, isn't, um, this has actually been found in other insects. The setse fly, who pupates underground, um, can synchronize emergence to like a 0.4 per hour thermal period. So to our knowledge, this is another addition to looking at the sensitivity of clocks and in, um, insects that emerge from light restricted environments. So what about these weird emergence ready bees? What are they waiting for? <laughs> so what we wanted to look at, if you want to get the emergence ready bee stage um, isolated, you have to let some bees emerge first because then you know the rest of the bees are about to emerge and they're emergence ready. So what we did is for the first four days of emergence, we put them in constant conditions. So remember when they don't have a Zeitgeber, they're marching at the beat of their own drum. Nobody knows what time it is. They're all coming out when they want, or when they, when they do. And the, after four days above this dash line, we gave them a thermal period that each day. What you can see is quickly, these emergence ready bees were able to pick up on that cue and synchronize their emergence. So we know that emergence ready bees are at least ready for that cue. So what about photo period? Because as I mentioned before, they would probably be the stage in which they would be most likely experiencing photo period. We did the same thing. Constant conditions, we have this asynchronous emergence, and then when we turn the photo period on, we have, you can clearly see, they synchronized to when the lights turn on. 
So to sum up, uh, we saw that this bee is really sensitive to changes in temperature. Um, they respond to light cues and light gets into the brood cell. So there's actually a lot more work that we're gonna do with um, looking at the relevance of light because we've just scraped the surface. So Corey, um, an undergraduate who's working with me, is actually going to look at individual wavelengths to see if what wavelength is actually interacting with their circadian clocks. And we predict that um, UV would be a big player and maybe infrared would not because a lot of insects don't have an infrared receptor. So we're going to test different wavelengths of light. So we talked about this side of the story. We're gonna put it to bed. The next side of the story we're going to talk about is this spring cold snap scenario or chill injury. What are the consequences of experiencing cold during active development and how does that affect adult bees? So here again is this second question here. How does low temperature, whether it be a cold snap or a farmer sticking you in the fridge, how does this affect adult performance? So in order to talk about um, the effects of cold temperature, we needed, I needed to like separate this into two halves. One, we don't know a lot about the cold tolerance of this animal. And cold tolerance is um, a body of work that you can use to make inferences about an animal's tolerance, to tolerance to cold. And it's not something where you can take one single measure and be like, this animal's cold tolerance is X, right? So we have to actually look at and survey a bunch of things about their physiology and their responses to stress. So we looked at survival and effective stage and then thermal physiology, which I'll explain. So the other part that we need to look at is how this affects adults. And adult performance can be measured in an infinite number of ways. So we tried to kind of cast our net broadly and we wanted to look at flight performance because that's super important for females to finish their nests. They're actually flying between seven, eight hours a day building their nests. They're doing a ton of work carrying leaves, carrying pollen, carrying nectar. And males, they gotta fly in order to find those females. And that's pretty much it. And then also, activity, how active are adults, and then how long do those adults live? So the first thing we're gonna focus on is cold tolerance. And cold tolerance <coughs> is really cool in some of my favorite work. <laughs> Shout out to my favorite cold tolerance committee members. And, um, the things that we wanted to look at were um, thermal performance measures. And these measures are called critical thermal minimum, recovery from chill coma, and super cooling point. And I'll walk you through what these are, and you'll kind of see why they're so relevant to characterizing cold tolerance of an animal. So a critical thermal minimum is when you reach a point where you can no longer sustain normal activity because it's too cold, and so your muscles don't work. And so that would be around this point here. And then chill coma recovery is the time it takes you to recover from being in that state where you can't move. So how long does it take you to recover when you dip below your critical thermal minimum? Super cooling point's really awesome because and it's probably like some of my favorite data I've ever collected because you can see it really clearly when you look at a graph. So here we have super cooling point. It's the point just before ice crystallization. And when you have ice crystallization, heat is released. So you can actually clearly identify where the supercooling point is because heat is released right after that crystallization. The cool thing about supercooling point for insects is that it tells you an extra piece of information. Don't you love data that like gives you a little extra? Well, this data also tells you what their strategy is. Are they freeze intolerant or are they freeze tolerant? So if they live below their super, if they can freeze and then live, they are freeze tolerant. If they freeze and then die, they're freeze intolerant. So first let's talk about how we measured critical thermal minimum. Um, I, I'm gonna first walk you through our trusty thermal performance curve because I, I think I've seen a thermal performance curve in like the last 20 talks I've seen, but I just got back from a conference, so maybe that's fine. So how this works is if you're not familiar, if we have an animal's performance on the y-axis, you have an optimal temperature range at which you can operate and live your life. But once you start getting further away from that thermal range and closer to your critical thermal minimum or critical thermal maximum, your performance just drops. 
And so remember, I said critical thermal minimum is the point where you just can't move anymore. And if you can't move, you can't do anything. And you're really like vulnerable. So it's a really important temperature. Um, and what we, how we did this is Corey put bees inside of a tube, put the, a little toothpick inside there, slowly decreased the temperature, and waited for the bee to no longer be able to hold on, and they'll fall off. That's pretty good evidence to show us that that's their critical thermal minimum. And this is a, a method that has been replicated in other studies. So how do we look at their chill coma recovery? Well, we have to see how long it takes for them to be in that state where they can't move. How long does it take for them to recover? So how you know an insect recovers is if they can flip over. So that's a pretty easy thing to point out. One of the big questions though, remember, is I want to know how low temperatures during development could affect both of these measures. It's great that we're gonna be collecting this important threshold data, but we wanna know, can they be affected by um, cold stress when you're developing? So we have two different types of cold stress that we use here. One, when they're actively developing, is just a static, week-long stress. Um, another one is just a fluctuating stress, and um, which is a, a little bit more ecologically relevant, but it's not ecologically derived. It's just a fluctuating temperature stress. So two week-long stressors during development. How does this affect adults? Your MRL planes. <laughs> we got critical thermal minimum data first. So if we can just walk it through these graphs here, we have our control, and then our fluctuating stress and static stress. You can see that there was no statistical difference between if they experienced these and it affecting their adult CT min, which was really actually surprising to me because I thought if you um, were injured or something happened because of these stressors, it may affect your ability to withstand low temperatures. But what was, what was cool is we saw that the CT min was statistically different between females and male bees. So we know now that their CT min is around like six degrees, and for males, it's about a degree less than that. Um, so we saw some sexual dimorphism in this, and I thought that was really cool. And if I had more time, I'd love to look into more about sexual dimorphic um, differences. So their um, CT min is actually really comparable to other insects. Usually it's between zero and like less than 10 degrees for most adult insects. So what about chill coma recovery? So if we stress them out during development and then as adults gave them another cold shock, how long will it take for them to recover or can they recover? So what we did is just that. We exposed them to a stress during development and you can see there are two stressors here. And then as adults, we gave them a cold shock which was about zero degrees for two days, which is actually kind of intense. And we saw how long it took them to recover. If one hour did they recover all the way up to 24 hours. And so you can see our control bees, they had no problem recovering from that zero degree stress. But if you were given a stress during development, if you experienced another one as an adult, you were way less likely to recover from that stress. And that was a statistical difference. So that was really cool to us. So whether you're experiencing a spring cold snap or whether a farmer is putting you in the fridge, you may not be able to survive another stress after that. It could be compromising your ability as an adult to survive another stress. Oh, so this is my, like, some of my favorite data, super cooling points, all right? The point just before um, freezing. So how do you measure this? Well, what we did is we adhered uh, bees using vacuum grease on these I buttons here, and I buttons are cool little disks that take temperature readings, and they're sensitive enough to, to measure this little heat release here. And so um, what this looks like is, this is actual data that, uh, that came from the bees and it's just beautiful. I love it, you can just identify right there. That's the super cooling point. And so we put them in that container and just put them in a freezer at negative 80 and let it drop before the I buttons broke because they're only rated to go down to negative 50. <laughs> I may have not found that out the easy way. <laughs> and you're able to identify their supercooling point. So I wanted to look at supercooling point across development because they could experience cold at any time during their pupil metamorphosis. So what did we find? We looked at, um, across stages here, 
this big old mouth of words, post diapause quiescent pre-pupa, actually just means, remember our big old fat overwintering pupa, pre-pupa, they're exiting their overwintering stage and they're ready for the cue to stimulate metamorphosis. And so their super cooling point was rather low, it was um, below negative 20. Um, but when you started development, uh, your super cooling point raised about 10 degrees. And this doesn't change across um, pupil metamorphosis and for emergence ready bees, which this actually surprised us because in other insects that don't overwinter in their uh, adult stage, this tends to be the most uh, cold sensitive stage. So we were actually pretty impressed that our emergence ready bees could withstand um, negative 15. So to, since we know their super cooling points, we know that their super cooling point is um, you know, negative 10 or negative 25, then we can uh, try to assess, all right, what temperature is a little higher than that is a stress for them? And how does this uh, vary across development? So since we know their super cooling points, since we know their CT min, what we did is we stuck different developmental stages at negative five. So a temperature above their super cooling point, but below their CT min. And we set them in there for one to four days. Man, look at these pre pupa they're just bulletproof. They're like, we don't care that we just spent all this time in negative five, and they're good to go. You can see that most of them survive. But if you are an actively developing pupa, this is the red eye stage, your survival quickly declines with time spent at negative five. And for this emergence ready stage, we see that after two days, we're, they're done, they're done so. So you can see that the timing of these um, cold treatments actually could really matter, whether it's mother nature or whether it's a farmer. One super cool result that we saw from this last survival study was that all, and some of the bees in the red eye stage, this red eye pupil stage, exhibited wing deformities. So some bees, this is a normal bee here with normal wings, and here are, here's one with some of the deformity. You can see it almost looks like saran wrap around their thorax and then their wings are all like crumpled up. Uh, one of the hypotheses we have for this is that um, the cold injury that they sustain is affecting their neuromuscular junctions and they don't have the right muscle movements to inflate their wings and fully occlose. And so that's why we only thought we saw it in this stage because they are, this is pre-eclosion. And eclosion, for those of you that don't work for insects, is your last molt into the adult stage. So in summary, we found that cold tolerance and thermal physiology can really be affected um, by cold experience during development, all right? So we know that low temperatures affected adult thermal performance. Um, it did not affect CT min, but it did affect chill coma recovery and the likelihood of you surviving a second stress. And then also we characterized um, these important thermal thresholds and saw that across development, um, cold tolerance can vary. So next on the list is adult performance, all right? So we, this was probably like some of the funnest work that I did because I got to learn a really cool technique called respirometry. And respirometry is used to measure metabolic rates. Um, so, you know, one of the first projects I worked on, Kendra was like, Megan, I need you to get a bee to fly in a jar. And I'm like, no problem. Well, it's a lot harder than you think. <laughs> Spent a lot of time on it, okay? So because these bees didn't fly in the jar like I needed them to, I had to create a tether or a little bee leash to get them to fly in a jar. And this is important because for a respirometry system, there's incoming air that is scrubbed of CO2 and water, and then whatever the animal's breathing is going out of this chamber and then into a CO2 analyzer. So we know what their a, a proxy for metabolic rate is CO2 emission. And so how this tether works, it's really cute. <laughs> it's a needle and it, the tip is cut off, and then there's a little string lassoed through there um, insects, when they have a stimulus, flying insects, their stimulus when their feet leave the ground. Um, this is like presenter ready. So, oh, there we go. When their feet leave the ground, their wings start to, just, it's a flying response when their feet leave the ground. So I um, took advantage of this response, and you can see me there 
pulling that piece of styrofoam away from the flying bee. She's on the tether, and you can see she immediately flew. And so I took advantage of that response by putting a stage here, and the bee sits on the stage, and then on the outside of the container, I, move, I can move the stage from under their feet and get them to fly. So to show you what this metabolic data looks like, it's just beautiful. This is what a bee's CO2 emissions look like when they're at rest. Um, and how did I get a flying insect to rest? Well, it's really funny when these bees emerge and you leave their brood cell in with them, they like to like put their head inside like a sleeping bag and just hang out there. <laughs> so I just cut the brood cell um, back a little bit because they breathe out of their abdomen and was able to get them to chill out and I got these beautiful resting metabolic rates. So when a bee starts flying, you can see their metabolic rate is just way different. It increases um, like tenfold and you can see these are little individual flight valves. So with this, we're able to analyze their metabolic rate, but also how long they're flying for. So I had to summarize this data for you because this talk can't be two hours. <laughs> so um, I'm showing you here with our flight performance stuff, we found that they had shorter flight valves if you were exposed to a low temperature during development. And also, um, you had lower flight metabolic rates, and some of them even had tattered wings. And when we measured, uh, we did morphometrics on the wings. When we, when we did that, we found that a lot of them had shorter wing lengths. And for a bee, this is actually not very good because having a shorter wing length can affect your wing loading, and wing loading is how much you can carry. And so that's really important for a species like this that's always carrying leaves. So what we also saw, though, was this was really cool. Um, some of the bees that were exposed to stress during this red-eye stage exhibited weird flight defects. So I'm going to show you what a normal bee looks like. This is a bee on my tether. Right when I lifted those feet off the ground, the wings are flying and the abdomen's pumping. That is just characteristic flight behavior. But if we look at what happens to a bee that was given a low temperature stress, when I lift her off, you can see no flap in there, no pumping. She just sucks and can't fly. And so I thought that I was doing something wrong and just like after getting like super frustrated that my tether wasn't working, I actually realized this was a result. And about 50% of the bees that were exposed to cold stress could not fly. So it's the, one, the ones that can survive, how active are they? And then also how long do they live? Two critical things if you want to assess adult performance, right? And so what we had to do to spy on these bees is create little bee condos. And they have everything they need in here. They have access to food in this tube. They even need a little ladder because they're princesses. <laughs> they got to have the ladder. And they'll climb up this ladder and access their food here. So what we did is we watched them. And we watched them five times a day for like three days. And we scored what they were doing. Are they feeding? Are they active but not feeding? Or are they just not doing anything and they're not active? And we also, this is how we took longevity too, is just let them see how long they can live in there. So what we found is that adults had less feeding activity, um, but they also had shorter longevity if you were exposed to um, low temperatures during development. I'm just showing you the longevity graph here. We have um, control bees that lived for like a com comparable um, lengths of time to wild megachylae. So I was like patting myself on the back on that one. I'm like, yeah, we got them to live like around 20 days or a little under 20 days, which is about how long they live in the wild. And then also, um, you can see clearly here, if they were given some kind of temperature stress, whether it was fluctuating or static, man, dude, that just really hit them hard. And it didn't hit them, hit them hard in the same way. You can see that males were affected more than females were. So we saw some, again, sex dimorphism in the effects of our low temperature stress. And so this is bad news. If you're a male that only lives half as long as a female, like that could really jeopardize mating opportunities and things like that. So we thought that was really awesome and interesting that again we saw these sex dimorphic differences. Man, if I had another five years. <laughs> I won't push that on myself. <laughs> All right, so in summary, what did we find? Dude, low temperature stress just hurt these bees. They kicked them down. All right, we found they had shorter flight bouts, lower CO2 emissions. Remember, they had less feeding activity damaged wings, shorter wings, like the whole gamut. 
defects in play, and they live for much shorter amounts of time. And so this has, we gotta go back to our, uh, our significance, right? So in agriculture, the significance of this is, dude, if you stress your bees out, your bees might not be good. Just because they survive, they may not be able to perform the way that you want them to. And actually, the temperatures that I used in my study were the standard management practices being used today. So hopefully this information can be translated to the farmer so they can make that decision, what's more important, synchronizing emergence or like dumb bees, right? So our data, when we go back to the synchronizing stuff, since we know what cues um, that they're listening to, farmers could utilize this information and try to better synchronize emergence. On the basic science, the side of the spectrum, we know that cold snaps could possibly affect bee health, and then also temperature variability may affect the timing of emergence. And so, get ready for my acknowledgments, because it's probably like five minutes long. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to cry. <laughs> All right, so I was looking for pictures of my lab and I couldn't find a picture I wasn't in. <laughs> so um, I've been in Kendra's lab since 2009 and I did my undergrad there and also a PhD. Um, so I just have a bucket load of memories. It's just uh, unreal. From our lab parties that we've had, our lab has always been like really, like we had such a really strong sense of camaraderie and so like, I just, I couldn't be more proud to come out of a lab that was so nurturing and amazing and incredible. Um, we always have a ton of fun. At one of our parties, we did like henna, and so we always do things that are like kind of fun and creative together. Um, Kimmy knows her hands in that picture. <laughs> also, Kendra just in general has been an incredible female role model for me. She um, was one of the first people to tell me I could do a PhD, and before she told me that, it never even crossed my mind. I thought I was too dumb, and here I am. So that's pretty incredible. Um, and so that's an old picture of me and her, and she's, uh, we're doing a photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my favorite memories in my lab has been in Argonne. We went to uh, the National, Argonne National Laboratory, which we used the particle accelerator to study insect structure and function of respiratory systems. So we actually got to stick insects into a particle accelerator and, met and see their trachea, which are their breathing tubes. So those are some of my funnest memories. I went to Argonne like four or five times, and it's really awesome because you work around the clock, and we're just there doing hardcore science. Um, because we're working around the clock, we get a little loopy sometimes, and they have these trikes that you can drive around. So like the scientists drive these trikes. So we would be like driving trikes, and then me and Kendra would be like sleep deprived and decide to like find a spider outside and stick it in the particle accelerator. <laughs> I didn't think we put a carrot in there. <laughs> I don't have to like prove to you that our lab is a lot of fun because I, I think I'm demonstrating that now. This summer we had a super successful RAU program where we um, tagged a wall downtown. This is one you can legally spray paint. I'm not like incriminating myself right now. <laughs> But you can see us uh, putting, making our mark on the city, and gosh, that was fun. So Joe's gonna hate me for putting this picture. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, we're, we're not alone in this relationship. I was blessed to have like a really awesome extended family of scientists, and that includes those two guys circled there. These are our USDA collaborators, my co-advisor Joe and George, and. Um, They've just like been so welcoming and amazing, letting us just freaking rip apart the USDA. <laughs> like, it's in a candy store. We're like, science, science, science. And so like every idea that I ever had, they were always on board and like trying to help me. And also it was just a fun environment to work in because every time Joe leaves, we do something to him. <laughs> so when you're looking at our pictures of when Joe leaves, we like to welcome him back. We went, wrapped his whole office and wrapping paper here. And Kendra had a lot of fun with this. I think she was like one of the first people in there to put wrapping paper and one of the last people in there. <laughs> she also even thought it was funny to wrap the carpet. So <laughs> that was her idea. And we wrapped the pens. How long did it take you to unwrap everything? I think you slowly it did it. Yeah, it was so <laughs> process. 
So another time Joe left, he, he left a lot this summer because he's a busy guy. We thought he had like a second lap family or something. So we had to like make sure he was welcome back like every time. Another thing we did is we put self-portraits on his window. So we all drew our own self-portraits. Thanks, Julia. <laughs> And of course, when George leaves, we gotta do something for him too, make him feel welcome. So that is a picture of Joe, if you need more proof. <laughs> so this is George's office, and Joe is making a beautiful piece of art. We ended up like making like a whole canyon with like rivers and like putting George's name on his window. And yeah, it's a really like a pro a productive use of office supplies. <laughs> All right, you ready for this one? So, what is this? <laughs> so this is George right here, and what he's doing is he is rescuing Joe, because Joe had a car full of students, and they ran out of gas. <laughs> I thought I would snap this picture, and I'm like, I'm using that for my defense. <laughs> I also got to thank the Bennett family, because they're incredible, and they've supported me through this. That's me and my dad, my mom, and my brother when he was last here in Fargo. I've been with Kendra for eight years, two months, 20 days, and two hours. And that's actually, if it's 10 o'clock, yep, that's right. So that's how long I've been with Kendra and in this lab. And I have to leave you with a tarot card because I'm weird like that. And this has actually got me through the last couple months. What this represents is um, your roots and you growing as an individual because of your sense of community. So this is George, Julia, Kendra, and Joe. <laughs> undergo metamorphosis and be my own butterfly, but I'll always have my roots with the Fargo Research Group. I love you guys. <laughs>
So they could have this compound on the outside of their cuticle, which if I had more time, I'd love to look at, but I can't remember the name of it. Could be one way that they're receiving these cues. <coughs> We know that they have a UV receptor, we know that they have a blue, and I think a peak and a green. So it's possible um, that they have a green receptor because in our BB counter experiments, we use fluorescent lighting, which if you look at what fluorescent lighting is composed of, it's mostly yellow and green wavelengths. So that supports a hypothesis that they have, you know, maybe a green receptor, or yellow receptor. And then they have a part of the brain Yes, I believe so. I, I think, oh God, this is like my comps, I forgot, but I think it's like um, either their optic lobes or, I'm not sure though, yeah, occipital lobes, but Steven's like, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> forgot to study that one. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I kept you here quite long. I kind of kept you captive with all my pictures, but yeah. Quick question. You did, it seemed like, I know you had the, the famous Yoakum et al. paper to sort of work from the 29 degrees that you used, mm -hmm. but did you do other temperatures when you varied the, the, the photo period? I mean, why did you choose that 29 degrees? It seems like that's what you were using uh, primarily. Yeah, so our 29 degrees is kind of our standard for what we think is close to the thermal optimum. We're working on measuring the thermal optimum. But we saw, I think it was Bosch and Kemp, like 2002, found that 29 degrees um, has the highest survival of these versus other temperatures around that temperature. So it's kind of always been our standard, but it's a good question. We need to look into more like, what is their optimal temperature? Or so we have a cool bar to look at that. Or if you had a low, if you had them at a lower temperature and tried varying the photo period, would that show a stronger response than uh, the temperature response? So Yoakum et al showed he did different thermal periods of different amplitudes with the same mean and so he did like a two degree which is just fluctuating around a, around 29 a four degree and then an eight degree and they do synchronize emergence but they change the time at which they're synchronized to the ramp speed yeah so it might be like a little bit after a little bit before mm -hmm. yeah but with that ramp uh the, the experiment you did. You, you mentioned that it was similar, similar results with C65. So maybe you could tell us if you think the environmental cues that C flies are getting and the change in environmental cues are going to be similar to your insect. I think, like, so we've also seen in flesh flies and onion flies and setse flies, all these insects puke in underground. There's strong evidence to show that they have temperature mediated clocks. And so I would think because of our similar life history with, um, it's similar in the way that they're light restricted. They're not underground, there are ground nesting bees, which I would predict respond in a very similar way. Um, but yeah, I would predict because of their cavity nesting life history, it's very similar because of that light restriction. What about the temperature and photoperiodic environments? That, um, that this bee experiences? And comparing that with CC. Well, I believe that sensei flies are at an African species, so like closer to the equator, I would think that, you know, the cues start getting more interesting. I, sometimes, once you get closer to the equator, uh, common zygabers are like precipitation, changes in precipitation, so it could be, that could be a factor as well. So if you're close to the equator, and I mean, there are multiple CT5 species. Mm -hmm. um, how's your photo period and temperature changes going to be compared to a temperate climate? I see. So I would change the day length. Um, once you get closer to the equator, you're getting closer to like a 12-12. And when we're like in our northern latitudes, we're seeing like longer days in the spring, right? So we're seeing like a photo period of like 16 hours of light, 8 hours of day. But what about the changes in those photo periods? 
Yes, so um, there, there, ha there has been work shown that the changes in photo period are a strong cue for animals. Um, no, this is called like a... Sorry, Megan. Yeah. Tsetse oh, flies. Oh, tsetse flies. Um, in particular, the change in photo period. You know, I'm not super uh, familiar with their life history, but if, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out what you're getting at. But. Well, in the tropics, particularly near the equator, the photo period is not going to change. No. Basically. And neither is the temperature. So you've got quite different environments and cues, potentially cues that are going to trigger these things. So maybe the, the comparison with the two species is may not be relevant. Well, I brought it up because we found that sese flies, actually we didn't find, but Dave Denlinger found that they can entrain or synchronize to a ramp speed of about 0.47 or 0.48 degrees. And so that's why I brought it up because it's actually the only other citation that I could find looking at the sensitivity of insects to temperature. Are there any situations in nature where photoperiod can become uncoupled from temperature? Yes. So I would say that one of those situations would be um, temperature variability. So like a spring cold snap, and you have a, you have a photoperiod that's saying it's spring, but then you have a spring cold snap, well, that could be a misleading cue. I didn't show you this data today because I just had so much data I couldn't fit it. My talk was already way too long. But I looked at if you experience a temperature stress during development, if that affects um, your ability to synchronize to a zeitgeber. And I did the I did the stress like during development and didn't see an effect on the timing of emergence. But I would be interested to give the emergence ready bees a stress and see if that affects their ability to entrain to temperature. So, okay, so what I was trying to get at is that uh, with the sun going up and down, there's always going to be some small scale t uh, daily temperature fluctuation, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So are there any environment where those fluctuations become completely masked? Yeah, um, like in a cavity, in a brood cell, perhaps. I measured the, I was interested in the microclimate of the brood cell, and so I measured temperatures inside the brood cell. I didn't present that data today, but we didn't see a significant difference between the inside of the brood cell and the outside of the brood cell. So it could be buffered in the cavity. I do have a bunch of nest temperatures I could look at, but I haven't done that analysis yet. Um, so, you know, on that, along those same lines of thinking, you could also argue that on a cloudy day, um, there could be less light, um, even though that you're getting um, temperature cues. So yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the wild, if they're in the ground, mm -hmm. how deep are they? And, and what, how much buffering do you think there might be with soil temperature relative to all these other external changes? Great question. So in this species, they're above ground nesters, but there are other solitary bees, a lot of solitary bees that are ground nesters. Um, there's one citation that I found that about um, 10 inches underground, you have like no light penetra penetrating, or 10 centimeters, I mean. Two inches, like your light is like really diminished, okay? Um, temperature, I would assume that it is buffered, but as we saw, like they could be really sensitive to temperature, and even if it is buffered, I mean, they might still be able to syn synchronize to those cues. But yeah, those are great questions. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your support and questions from Meg. We'll thank her.